Coming up on Koshi's Business Builders, we find out how to sustain a strong manufacturing business, hear the innovative startup story of Naked Wines, and get some frank advice from the founders of a coffee scrub. Hey, great to see you and thanks for tuning in. We have a fantastic show ahead for you. We start today with some tips from a successful family business manufacturing right here in Australia. Then we chat to Naked Wines, who have gone from startup to selling 250,000 cases of wine this year. Plus, some business tips from the girls at Frank Body Scrub, a look at one of your business ideas in Elevator Pitch, and Val Quinn back with a handy tech tip as well. So let's jump straight into it with news you can use. Over 284,000 businesses were started in Australia last year, so if you're thinking about starting something up, you're not alone. However, unlike a school of fish, there are no safety in numbers. The ABS also recorded 263,000 business exits. So how do you stack the odds in your favour? It starts with considering what you actually want to achieve with your business. By doing this, you'll be able to clarify your personal and financial goals. Then look at the idea through an investor's eyes. Who's the target market? What problem is being solved? What resources will be required to get it off the ground? And what does the business roughly look like? At the beginning, it's worth running your numbers through a business viability calculator, like the one on the NAB Business Tips website. If they stack up, complete a business plan and test the market. For more tips and tools, visit nab.com.au slash kbb. Spotgo is a family business that manufactures cleaning products on the central coast of New South Wales. They've got a product that's made in Australia by Australians for Australians, and they are going great guns. We sent in NAB's Rose Charles to see how they've stayed so competitive. Brendan, it's a family business operating since 1966. Tell us about the Spotgo story and how it started. Well, I was born into the commercial cleaning and carpet cleaning industry. My parents own two different companies, so it, it's in my blood. So in 2000, you know, after 20 odd years of working alongside my parents, it became my, my baby. You know, as I'm mindlessly cleaning carpets, I then started dreaming, and, and the dream was to develop my own carpet spot cleaner, and that's where it started. But I then engaged an industrial chemist to start working with me, and uh, over three and a half years, we came up with an amazing, I believe, carpet spot cleaner. And Brendan, 100% Australian made, tell me about the decision. You know, the trend or the, the attitude at the moment is, is sort of heading overseas for manufacturing. I don't think it needs to be that, you know. So we stood back and sort of looked at it and thought, well, can we build something? We've got some of the best chemists available to us, best manufacturers for, you know, breaking down our brands. We just need to do our research, you know. It, it's easy to say, let's just go overseas and let's get someone else to build our packaging when if you slow down and you sort of think, well, OK, we can do this. I think it's great that um, you made that decision. And what changes have you made to the business since you took over? Uh, we are developing a multi-purpose bathroom cleaner. It is absolutely fundamental for SpotGo that we move into other areas as well. You know, we, we need to be statewide. How have you coped with the growth? We have a passionate team behind SpotGo. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be here right now. So our parents are involved, backing us up. Our children are even involved. You know, we do it as a family. After the break, we get Brendan's advice for other small businesses. Wise words from someone who's been there, done that. Don't miss it. Before the break, Brendan told us about his passionate team and how good research has made it possible to make his products in Australia. Now it's time to hear his tips for other small businesses. Brendan, being an Australian-made company, how do you feel this provides you with the upper hand in comparison to your competitors? We know what the customers want. You know, we are Australians. We're here on the ground. We know how 
dirty our windows get. We know the sort of stains that our carpets get. So competing against them, we have absolutely got the upper hand because we're Aussies building products for Aussies. Obviously, family have been a huge supporter of your business. Tell me about external business partners uh, that have helped you get to where you are today. Well, it's fundamental. You know, we um, first and foremost, we, we couldn't be building what we're building with, with our, without our lender, NAB. You know, NAB, uh, absolutely fundamental to us going forwards. If, uh, if we didn't have them all come on board, there'd be no spot go. You know, and this is an ongoing relationship. You know, we re revisit our business plan monthly. We then talk to our banker, explain to him why we're heading in a certain direction. Every time he's gone, love it. You're heading in a great direction. Let's go, what do you need? How do you need our support? So Brendan, for somebody sitting at home watching this today, somebody wanting to start a new business, a new small business, what would you recommend that they start doing? The first thing you've got to do is work out what you're interested in doing, where your interest is, whether it's a service you want to provide, whether it's a, a product you want to build, then work on your business plan because the business plan will force you to break every part of that either service down or the, the product you're trying to build. You know, in our case, it's getting on and, 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 and finding out who supplies those parts within mm -hmm. the country, getting samples sent of those parts of your brand, and then working out which provider is giving you the best result. Excellent, thank you. My pleasure. See, manufacturing is not dead in Australia. It's a great example, pick a niche, and you can be successful. Yeah, I think um, Brendan's a fantastic example of a, a customer that has a real passion for what they do. And, you know, he's got over 20 years experience in the cleaning industry. And through that, he's been able to identify a niche. And off the back of that niche and that core product that he's built, he's been able to build other ancillary products that can support the rest of the business. So it's a great story. And it's a bit of a mistake we sometimes make in small business that we don't think through the logical extension of what we do well. Yeah, so I think it's really important that you have those support mechanisms around you. So Brendan, obviously, he knows cleaning, uh, but he really needed to work on the marketing aspects of his business. You know, HR, he's got quite a few people working for him, financials, etc. So I think it's really important that you get help from specialists, accountants, etc., that can help your business grow and prosper, yeah. because that is money really well spent. And he's really enthusiastic about his relationship with his banker as well. That's something that he benefits a lot from. Well, I think enthusiasm is something that's very important. So if you're enthusiastic in your business, you're probably more likely to succeed. Yep. Um, but I think, yeah, it is really important, not just from a banking perspective, but from your own business, that when you set yourself goals, you hold yourself accountable to delivering on those goals. Yep. So I think that's something that absolutely you should be looking to do. Thanks for that, Tim. Good to see you. All right, now let's see if somebody else can build success into the future with this week's Elevator Pitch. SMEs make up 33% of our GDP and are Australia's largest employer group. The digital economy means businesses must now think, act and compete globally. This shift opens up new opportunities. However, if not careful, businesses can incur significant investment and financial risks as they navigate this disruptive trend. HEO Hub is a startup platform that mitigates the financial and adoption risks of a business accessing new technology. With upfront costs, with no upfront costs, businesses have full access to a complete suite of tools including CRM, projects, documents, management, data dashboards, events functions and a whole lot more. With drag and drop save functionality, HEO Hub is fully customisable, saving SMEs implementation, programming and consulting costs. The launch of our free business development applications are set to change the way that SMEs develop new business and commercialise relationships. The Hub is designed to help businesses better connect, communicate and collaborate. Be confused. Yeah, but I am too. <laughs> I'm... I was thinking, I'm a bit of an idiot here because I'm not quite sure what it's it, all about. Is he talking about basically just cloud-based software like a NetSuite, like a Zero? But I think, think we're it's putting like around. I think it's more of an entrepot. Like it's a, um, it's a CRM system yeah. that uh, helps startups or small businesses scale their business. So you know, it would include uh, email marketing software and mm. that type of thing. Like and a Salesforce almost. Yeah, kind of like a Salesforce, a Salesforce but, a, but, but, for, small, but for small, small businesses, yeah. At the beginning though, he mentioned about 
like working overseas and expanding overseas. And I just wasn't sure whether he was trying to imply something about getting around working overseas or knowing how to I think he was talking about change as um, in the digital economy that a small business in Australia can still reach overseas right. customers that okay. every that we're innately scalable. Okay. Yeah, which is right, isn't it? Using technology to to scale overseas. Ben, you're very quiet on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I just see it's a very large competitive market. There are a lot of software cloud solutions out there already. I'm, I'm struggling to see what the differential is. How is he going to make himself different to those? My, my, the big alarm bell for me was the fact that he wanted to make it free for, for people. Um, there's a lot out there that are already free and, and most of the free ones are, are pretty crap and uh, they don't really uh, you know, translate into doing all the, the operative things that a small business will, would need. Um, there's, there's a huge player in this space, by the way, called Entreport, uh, which is what I think he's kind of uh, getting close to. Um, so I'd maybe have a look at, um, if you're going to have a free version, it's always good to have, um, you know, other features and that that you can add on for a smaller cost. All right, so go to Entreport to see how you stack up. And if you do stack up and you're not, as Matt technically put it, crap, uh, you might be able to have a go. Coming up, we find out how Naked Wines has gone from strength to strength, even after physically running out of wine. Everyone's worst nightmare. We'll catch you soon. Now, Naked Wines is a disruptive business which essentially crowdfunds the production of wine through to their members or angels. Now, they've got 31 winemakers, 40,000 angels, and will sell 250,000 cases of wine this year alone. We caught up with wine director Mark Pollard to find out how they've done it. Mark, it's a really interesting business concept you've got here. Whereabouts the idea come from? Well, it was actually born from the inherent industry uh, issues at the moment. You know, there's less and less uh, shelf space for winemakers and there's less and less choice for consumers. So we flipped it on its head, said, let's, let's be kind to the winemakers, fund them up front uh, and empower them to make great wine. It's a really interesting business model. You say sort of crowdfunding the production of the wine. Basically, we go out and we get customers, angels, and we ask them to put $40 a month into an online piggy bank. It always remains their cash, but it gives us the ability to go and invest in winemakers. We've built this platform that, that enables the winemakers and their customers to communicate directly. So the winemakers get to hear straight from the horse's mouth how the wine tastes and what they think of the wine. And then on the other side, the angels get to engage with a personality, not just a brand. And Mark, what are your customer retention rates like? Uh, they're pretty bloody good, honestly. Um, I mean, compared to anything else in the industry, they're, they're miles above it. But what we've found out is that, that wine quality really is the, is the best retention tool. Um, you know, if, if the wine's amazing, if the prices are fantastic, uh, if it's been specifically funded, made for you, and you can't get it anywhere else, then why would you shop anywhere else? Also, compared to the industry, we, we have a very good delivery. We, uh, to major capital cities, we're delivering free next day. And what's the growth trajectory look like over the last three and a half years? Well, we started, obviously, with no angels. We, we're now up to 40,000 angels. Um, we started with no wine, and we're going to sell roughly 250,000 cases this year. And um, we've got 31 winemakers uh, as of today as well. So, Mark, you've gone through pretty rapid growth here. Has that presented any unique challenges? Yeah, it has. Um, we physically ran out of wine at some stage, and that was basically because we just had far too many customers. About a year and a half ago now, we introduced uh, a waiting list. So uh, that meant that people couldn't become angels straight away. They had to join a waiting list. Um, and that enabled us to control the amount of angels that came on, control the amount of wine that we needed. So it was a great method of controlling growth. And looking back at your business journey, what are some of the big highlights for you? 
Oh, the, the initial one, selling selling that first case, um, I remember walking into the, the warehouse and just going, oh my God, how are we going to sell all this wine? Um, and then literally a few months later, you know, we'd, run out of, we'd run out of sparkling wine. So just to see um, that first wine go off the shelf um, was, a, was a massive highlight, to believe, to see that the, the, the people believed in the idea and the concept and, and got behind the winemakers. And then secondly, um, changing people's lives. I mean, a lot of our winemakers literally started with nothing, absolutely nothing. Now they're moving, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 cases um, and they're buying vineyards, they're buying wineries, um, they're buying warehouses. So, yeah, we're really changing people's lives. That's a terrific story of an independent business propping up and, and, and breeding other independent businesses. Really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. And, Mark, what would you say to other people with a similarly innovative concept going into business. Live and breathe your vision. Um, be, be, be true to your vision, articulate it and, and make sure that you live it. Uh, it's so important. Well, that vision and passion certainly evident in yourself. Thanks a lot for sharing the story with us. No problems. This segment brought to you by Australia Post. What a great story. How good are small businesses supporting other small businesses? It's our lifeblood, isn't it? Mark says it's crucial to live and breathe your vision and look, I couldn't agree more. All right, now it's time to ask Koshi and lessons from a humble coffee scrub taking Instagram by storm. Hi, I'm Bree. I'm Jess. I'm Erica. And we are three of the five founders of Frank Body, and we're gonna give you three quick tips on business. My one is quality over quantity, specifically relating to social media. I think it's important to focus on one or two platforms that are really specific to your audience. Rather than trying to focus on too many and spread yourself too thin, get the first two right and then move on to the rest later. Mine would be to focus on making sure you do the boring stuff. So secure your trademarks and look at all of the potential regions that you might expand your business into and do the same thing there. Make sure you get all of your agreements in place too. Things like accounting to have that covered. Hey, yeah. that is fun. <laughs> Awful things. <laughs> Mine is all about branding, I think. Things like design, tone of voice and copywriting, your website, your packaging. It's really important to look at it as an investment and not an expense. It's going to save you a lot of time and money down the track. And remember that people are very visual and they want to be a part of brands that look good and that talk to them in an engaging way and in the end make them feel good. So that's us. Hope it helps. Thanks. It's Tech Tip Time with Val Quinn. Storing your files in the cloud has many advantages. You can view your files from any phone, tablet, or computer that's connected to the internet, and the cloud can also provide backup for files so they'll never disappear if your phone gets lost or your computer crashes. Using the cloud is a no-brainer, but picking which service to use is a bit more difficult. If you're ready to take the plunge into storing your files, photos, and more in the cloud, but need help deciding which service is right for your needs and wallet, then shop around and do your research. OneDrive and Dropbox are great business-focused tools for collaborating either internally with your teams or externally with your clients. Also, there's lots of security and even file logging. Google Drive is great because you can save your attachments straight to Google Drive from within the browser. OK, let's answer another one of your questions, and this one from Marie via Twitter. And Marie writes, I've got an online store selling handmade soaps, and it's taking up too much of my time. I'm constantly updating photos, information, packing, posting, as well as making the actual soap. Marie, we are everything, aren't we, in our small businesses? Is there an easier way to do all this without hiring staff? Now, it's a terrific question, and uh, to help us with the answer, I have Dirk Van Lameren, who's the boss of Small Business at Australia Post, so comes across these issues all the time. Dirk, Marie's issue is really common to most small businesses, is it? Yes, in talking to small business, you're right, David, uh, time and time management is one of the big issues. And listening to Marie, the first thing I would recommend to do is just, just keep track of what you're spending your time on. Uh, is it in operations? Is it in admin? Is it in shipping every day? And be honest and open to yourself. Where do I actually spend the time and where can I improve? Yep. And for instance, if that's in admin, 
uh, which is very likely, there are systems around uh, like Zero and Maya where you can easily uh, track your accounting and do everything. Um, in our world, we, we support a lot of businesses with online shopping. Uh, the e-commerce platforms of today are actually quite broad and, and all the function that you need to be successful as an online retailer are probably already in that platform. Yep. So look carefully what platform you're going on. And you can almost outsource everything these days, can't you? As you say, your, your e-commerce platforms, your admin, yeah. and even your staff yeah. hiring freelancers yeah. or, or contractors to come yeah. in and do it for you. And Marie, go to kbbtv.com.au if you want any more information. Particularly, have a look for Leanne Faulkner, who runs Billy Goat Soap. Very similar business to yours, but she has skyrocketed. She even exports now, and we'll have some great tips for you. We'll catch you next time. Coming up on next week's show, we find out how to allocate resources to drive growth, catch up with juice gurus Emma and Toms, and get some tips from the chocolate chief at Hague's.